Hello everybody. So in this video I wanted to start talking about excess scripts for random maps. So if you didn't know already, an excess script is basically an external script that can be attached to a random map and with it we can achieve some effects which are not possible to have in a random map alone. So in this video I'll go over the basics, what they are, how to use them, but as far as getting into the details of practical examples, that's going to have to be for future videos. But anyway, so uh, going to the very basics, uh, an excess script is basically just a text file which has the extension .xs, and in the AOE2 directory, they would go into resources common in this access folder. And in order to attach an access script to a random map, uh, for example, to this map here, that's that uh, particular command is include xs, leave one space, and then type the file name of the xs script you want to attach. So in this case, I want test.xs. So right now, if we have test.xs open, we can see that it uh, is completely blank right now. So when we are thinking about what we want to put in this access script, uh, there's a couple basic things to know. So there are two main structures in an access script that can contain the code you're going to use. Um, first is a uh, function And a function is basically something that when you house your code inside it, it will run once uh, when you call it. And the other code structure that you can use inside of an XS script is a rule. So a rule is similar to a function, but instead of only running once, it will run repeatedly over and over again until you tell it to stop. And within these functions and rules in the XS script, uh, we can do all sorts of things. We can declare variables and constants, and more importantly, we can call XS functions, which allow us to get and set data to and from the game. So that terminology may be a little confusing, but uh, it will make sense the more we go over it. So uh, to start this one off, I will start off with the most basic function in the access script, which is the main function. So when I say uh, void main, this just means that I'm not going to return any particular uh, type of variable. I'm just going to execute this code, which is in these curly brackets. And then in this function, I want to call the xs function, which is xs chat data. So in this xs function, I can chat whatever I want. I can say hello. And then if I restart my game, we can see that something certainly happened when we attach this xs file but it gave us an error saying we cannot parse the code for the main function. And uh, one of the key things to know about XS is that it is very syntax sensitive. And I would say that is more sensitive than an RMS. Um, basically, when we have an RMS, if we had an error in some place, it would just ignore that error and move on to the next thing it can interpret. And in contrast, if we have some sort of parsing error in an XS script, it will basically nullify the whole thing and no actions will take place. So the error in question is that for every um, either variable or constant that we declare in every XS function that we call, we need to have a semicolon at the end of the line. So if I add that semicolon, 
to fix the parsing error. We can see that our excess script just ch uh, chatted hello to us. So that's cool. Now, it's a fair question to ask why we knew that XS chat data was a valid XS function to use in this script. And that question kind of leads us to uh, this UGC guide. So this UGC guide is basically the best resource available if you are trying to learn XS scripting. So um, in addition to all of the XS functions that are available to uh, to use in an XS script. It goes through some of the basics, which I'm going to go through some of these too, but I'm going to be focusing on a bit more implementation and more practical examples. Um, but still, this is a great resource and it also directs you to this um, extension for Visual Studio Code, which I'm using, which also has in it all the XS functions uh, that are listed on this uh, page here. So the function called main is the only function that automatically gets called by the random app script when we uh, attach this XS. So that's one thing to know. And um, in addition to scripting a function, we'll try to script a rule next. So we'll say rule and we'll give it a name, say um, Uh, rule instructions. And with a rule, we have to say whether it's active or inactive. So this rule is going to be active as soon as the game starts. And then rules get called over and over again, so we have to sort of specify how often this rule is going to be called. So we can say min interval is 1, and then max interval is also 1. So this basically means that whatever code we have uh, contained in this rule will be executed every one second. Um, so in addition to specifying the min and max interval, uh, we could also specify high frequency, which basically calls this rule 60 times every physical second instead of min and max interval, which is based on game seconds. But what we will put in this rule is basically kind of an indication of time. So uh, prior to this declaration of the rule, we will create ourselves a variable. So when we declare a variable, we have to first declare what type of variable it is. And in this case, I want it to be an integer. So int specifies that our variable is going to be an integer. Uh, other variable types are bool, which is a true or false variable. We can say float, which is a decimal number, and a string. And a string is basically a string of characters which doesn't have a numerical value associated with it. But in our case, we're going to say integer, and we'll call it um, time and we'll set that equal to zero. And then within our rule, we will say xs chat data, and we will say time colon space, and then we will append uh, with this plus sign the value of this integer time. So. Uh, so initially, we will run this rule the first time, and it will say time is zero because that's this value over here. But then also, in addition to chatting the value, we will say up at the top, we'll say time plus plus. And that basically increments the value of this variable by one every time we execute this rule. So the first time we execute this rule, time will be increased from 0 to 1, and we will chat a 1. And then the second time this rule is executed, it will increase it from 1 to 2, and it should chat 2. So 
Uh, let's not forget our semicolons over here and up here when we declare the variable. And then let's see what this does. So basically every second we are going to be chatting uh, the time, which is one second uh, greater than the previous iteration. And as we can see, this is going to keep going and going because we never told it to stop. So in order to terminate this rule at some point, we can add a conditional. So we can say if, and then in parentheses, time is equal to 30, then we can use the XS function, which is XS disable self. So when we say XS disable self, it means whichever rule this is contain contained in will be disabled. And that's this rule here. Now, notice the difference when we are setting a value of a variable. We use only one equals character. And if we are checking the value of a variable with respect to something, we require two equal characters. So let's test this and see what changed. So similar to what we did last time, we can see that this keeps going up, but then we should also see that after it gets to 30, it should stop. So here at 30, that was the last thing it chatted, and that was because that we said when time equals 30, you can disable yourself. So that's uh, a very simple rule, and hopefully it gives you just the basics. Now next I want to talk a little bit more about how these things kind of work in the context of a random map. So one thing to know is that you can attach or include multiple XS files in the same random uh, in the same random map. So if I say I have test one says this and then test says this. I want them to chat different things so this one will just uh, chat test and this one will chat test one. So if I include both of those we can see what happens. So we can see that um, it gave us an error because even though we are able to include multiple um, access files uh, within those particular XS files, all of the function and rule names should be unique. So since we are using the main function, um, we we're trying to declare it twice and it's giving us an error saying we should only declare it once. Now, a way to get around this is uh, by doing the following. We can say rule test, um, you know, we can say this is active and high frequency and then if we just immediately access disable self basically this does the exact same thing as a function it just runs it once and then disables itself and then if I say a similar thing test one now when we uh, look at these two rules they, they, they have different names this rule is called test and this rule is called test1. So when we include both of those XS files, now they both execute their code and only one time because we disabled them immediately the first time after we executed. So that's one thing that's helpful to know. And then another very important thing to know about XS scripts is that they are always called after everything else in the game has already been determined. So let me try and give an example here. So let us try on this map to create an outpost for every player 
on top of this rock terrain. Now, outposts normally can't be built on rock terrain, and if we try to do that, it's a place for every player, terrain to place on rock, this shouldn't be able to work. And we can see that much when we restart our map is that no outpost gets placed. Now, if up at the top here, we could say effect amount set attribute of the outpost, we can set its terrain ID to zero, so that's not restricted to be placed on rock anymore. we can see that now the outpost was successfully able to be placed. Now, let us remove this effect for now, and then remove test number one, because we only need this one for now. So if we go back into test XS, and instead of um, chatting the data, we will um, use another XS function, which is XS effect amount. So effect amount uh, basically is doing the same thing as an effect amount that you would apply in an RMS. So the effect that we are going to be using is set attribute. And we're going to set the attributes of the outpost. So uh, we will see, say, outpost is 598. Now, in contrast to an RMS, we don't need to specify a constant in order to implement this into this particular argument here. We can just say 598, and it will properly interpret this argument as the outpost object. And then for the attribute we're going to modify, we'll say C terrain table, and we will set it to the value of zero. We will omit this extra argument, which is player number for now. And then this should basically do the same thing as the effect amount, which we previously applied, which is just setting the outpost's terrain table to zero. Let's make sure we don't forget our semicolon there. And then we will restart. And we can see that see? even though we are in our buildings tab and we can see that that our outposts that we can build are not restricted to be placed on rock the fact that um, this excess script was called last it doesn't enable the, our outpost here to be placed on rock because when this outpost is still trying to be placed this rule has not yet come into effect so that's one thing to know, is that an XS script cannot affect the way that a map will generate because it always happens last. And then we can try to give a different example. So we have for us here a scout cavalry here. And if we look at the game data, a scout cavalry um, normally has 45 hit points. Now let's see if we can just set it a little bit higher. So scout cavalry is 448. So we will set the attributes of the object 448. We will say C hit points. And instead of 45, we'll say 50. So notice that when we have our scout cavalry here, when we're starting in the castle age, we have 45 hit points plus 20 for bloodlines. And now let's restart and see what effects have taken place. So now we can see that we were successfully able to modify the hit points of the scout cavalry, but since it happened after bloodlines had already been researched, we basically kind of ignored the fact that bloodlines was researched and just set the HP straight to 50. 
And in contrast, if we tried that a different way with effect amount, set the attribute of the scout, ATTR hit points, we'll set that to 50 and we'll ignore these for now. See, uh, when we affect the attributes in the RMS, we do not override the fact that bloodlines will add an additional 20 HP to this unit. So that is a very important thing to know about excess is that it always occurs last. Additionally, one of the other advantages of an excess script is that it can bypass some of the limitations that normally exist uh, if you're just using RMS. So, for example, if I wanted to enable conscription and bypass the requirement of being in the Imperial Age, I can try to do that with RMS and say enable tech conscription is 315. So I'll try to enable conscription 315 and one of the limitations of just using that as an RMS effect is that that effect is basically useless and it doesn't bypass the age requirement. But if I try to do that exact same thing in an excess script instead, let's see if that makes a difference. So we will say C enable tech 315 attribute enable and we'll say 315. And we can see that uh, when we implement that in the excess script, it is now available to be researched, provided that we had enough gold for it. Um, but this can also be a double-edged sword in some cases, and it's something that we have to be rather careful of, because if we wanted to enable Loom, for example, that's tech 22. We can see that we enable Loom in the Castle Age after it's already been researched. So we can see our villagers have 40 HP and the associated armor when you get Loom. And there's nothing to prevent us from researching it a second time because there's no way to check whether it has been researched already. Monday. So that's one thing to know and to be careful of. So let's try and look at another example of how we can use excess to bypass some of the limitations that we would normally face in a random map. So we can see I have this monument in the middle and it's just a very generic looking monument. And if I wanted to give the monument different graphics, I could in the RM script say set Gaia civilization and say that's 15. And now the monument has different graphics, but then when I do that, I lose the ability to uh, modify any attributes for Gaia units that can also be player owned. And since this monument is a class of object that a player can own, I shouldn't be able to apply any effects to it. Say, for example, I shouldn't be able to modify its hit points because we happen to set Gaia Civilization. And we can see as much the hit points is still 9,999. But if I were to try that in excess instead, it says Gaia set attribute of the monument, which is 
826. See hit points. And we set it to 100. We can see that that was successfully able to modify the hit points of the monument despite us having set Gaia civilization. And then another one of the beauties of having an excess script is having the ability to apply effects on a player specific level. So uh, notice that whenever we were using this uh, excess effect amount, we left out the optional fifth argument, which is basically saying which player we're going to assign the effect to. If we omit that argument, it just applies it to everybody. But if we include that, we could specify a player to apply the effect to. So let's say I wanted to give an extra five range on this town center. So I can say, see add attribute, and then the town center ID is 109. See max range, I will add five range to it. Then I will specify that the effect will only be applied to player one with this argument over here. Then as we can see, uh, my town center now has six plus five range, whereas player two's town center only has six range. So that's one of the beauties of excess scripts is that we can apply effects on a player specific basis. In the future, we can see how we could potentially combine this parameter uh, with other sort of criteria to produce some very interesting effects. But um, until then, uh, there's just a couple of closing remarks. Um, so when we are using effects, we usually have these constants to define what we're going to be doing. So all of the constants that are used in excess are supposed to already be in the excess folder in this file called constants.xs. So all of the resources that are available in the game, all of the unit attributes should all be contained in this file. So in this case, we used C add attribute, and then we can see that that represents the value of four. So if I were to just switch out this constant for the value four, it would do the exact same thing. And then this constants file also gives you a sort of context as to where to use a particular thing. So for example, if we were using a modified tech, we would know that the arguments that we would be needing would be in this particular section over here, for example. So hopefully this gives you guys a brief overview as to the capabilities of XS. Now, if you're going to be creating these XS scripts from scratch, a fair bit of programming background it would be very helpful in order to uh, know exactly what's available. You can learn quite a lot from this uh, beginner's guide for excess scripting also, but even if you don't have a strong programming background, uh, you don't necessarily need to know all that much in order to be dangerous. A few examples can go a long way, and that's something I hope to be providing in the very near future. So thanks everybody for watching, and I'll see you next time.